testing the audio testing. Okay, I believe I've got it recording now. <coughs> Hope I've got it recording now. No. Is acting a little strange there for a minute. Today is uh, March 22nd, 2018. That is 6.05 at, uh, on Thursday evening. This is the normally scheduled lecture of uh, ITSE 2309 at uh, Collin College, Preston Ridge campus. And the, um, uh, this is 133. Okay, today we're going to review, I'm going to review the um, sub-select that we were doing before spring break. I'm sure everybody just studied really, really hard over spring break. I always did when I was a student. And if I may have your attention up here, uh, I have sent out the file. The file I'm going to be using today is attached to an announcement. And for those of you who are joining us on the uh, on the internet, and uh, we're, today we're talking about, I'm reviewing today's subselects. I've covered subselects once. Subselects comes to us from, what is it? Subselects are found in, subqueries are found in module eight of the, um, uh, in the modules, number eight, we're going to be number eight today. I'm going to move into number nine a little bit. Um, let me review subselects. The classic case in which to use a subselect, and anytime anything looks like one of these, anytime I ask you to find the maximum value, find the user, find the record that has the maximum value in a group of records. <clears throat> where you might have ties for that maximum value. A subselect is absolutely the easiest way to do it. Now, you, there's other ways that you might do it, but a subselect is the best way. Here is one where I want to find the greatest invoice total, uh, find the vendor ID who has the greatest invoice total, in invoices <laughs> okay now this is typically what lends itself to a subselect really lends itself very well is if everything comes from one table everything comes from the vendors table everything i need to know is in the vendors <clears throat> i could do this with a self join but it's a whole lot easier and a whole lot it seems to me to be a lot <clears throat> more intuitive to do it with a subselect so i say first First, go in here. I always look at this one running first. Go in and figure out what the maximum of the invoice total is. What is that value I'm trying to hit? <clears throat> now, show me all of the records, whatever, the records and invoices that the, where the invoice total is in that set. Okay. Couple of issues on <clears throat> this. You don't ever say on a subquery, you never say distinct. It's either in that set or it's not in that set. Doesn't have to be one. I don't care if it's one or 50. Okay. So just select the maximum. If I run, so this, if I were, were to execute this, and I can't execute this by itself, if I say execute, I will see what the what the maximum is. It's thirty seven thousand six hundred nine hundred sixty six dollars and nineteen cents. I just tell all that tells me is what is the maximum. Now find the vendor IDs where the invoice total is in that set. And now when I execute this, I'm going to get two of them. Number one, what is it? One twenty three and number one ten both have that value. And I think if you executed that query, you would only get one because I've set, I've made, made it be two of them. So I can find two. If I have three that tie, I have three or 10 or 20. It doesn't matter. I'll get all of them. Okay. It, it's tricky to do other than that. Questions. If 
I don't, if I'm not in this position where everything I want, so I can easily select vendor ID, <clears throat> I can select the invoice total, I can select anything about it as long as it is in the invoices table. I have to get it from the invoices table. If I don't, if I want something outside of the invoices table, I'm going to have to have a table join. So for example, I want vendor name. Vendor name is in the vendors table. Therefore, I have to join the vendors table and the invoices table to get that because I'm searching the invoices table, but I want to take something from the vendors table. A uh, little thing here I'm gonna mention, enter, join. We never in this class say join, just join. We don't say vendors join invoices. I'm not gonna be happy if I see any more of that and I'm gonna start taking off for it uh, because I still have people that are saying vendors join invoices um, and they're dropping that word enter. You can't do that in every platform. So there's some of them that just won't take it. I believe MySQL will throw an error if you say table A, join table B. You have to say enter join. Uh, so enter join invoices as I on where the keys meet. I had some people that said vendor ID is equal to invoice ID. No, 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 no. Vendor ID and invoice ID are two different values. <clears throat> and then after that, I can do the where the invoice total is in this one. So this one, if I execute this one, I will also get the vendor name. Oh, and the invoice total. Invoice total, I know what, that's gonna be the same on all of them. And it is. So this one just gives me back the um, invoice name, or the, excuse me, the vendor name. I have to specify which one I want the, which, which vendor ID I want. If I just say vendor ID, <clears throat> um, I will get a ambiguous column because it's in both vendors and invoices. It doesn't know which one to give me. Now I don't have to worry about that down in a subselect. If I have a, if I'm doing a subselect, I can't see down into the subselect. So if I'm taking something from one table on the outer query, I don't have to qualify it. It doesn't hurt it anything if you do. Questions? Okay. <clears throat> I've set up a little problem here. I'm talking about here, I'm talking about the idea. Uh, we've, we've looked at several options of this. Uh, I can have a subselect. I can select from a subselect. So remember, a, a, a select from where query is a table. That table, that select from where query can also go in the from line. That is called a derived table. And our text, our, let me see if I have a good option up here. On page five, we talk about derived tables. Page five, from, notice that select something from, I can select from a query. So I don't have to say where it's in. To me, it seems more intuitive to say where it's in some other query, but I can also select from a query because a query is a table. So the from can go up there. Now notice one thing about this uh, from, the from query where it's, where we have it here, the, the, this derived table, what, we, what the textbook calls a derived table, you must alias all of your calculated fields. So if you select max, you must give that table, that field a name. Okay. If you do it just, if you just say, if I, if I were to run this just on its own, 
I could do so without renaming that field, without renaming uh, max payment total. But if I'm going to use it as a, deri as a um, derived table, I must rename all of it. The other thing I must do is I must give the query a name. So the query can't just stand alone there. It has to be renamed. That's the one that I always forget. I forget to put that uh, as and give it a name. Doesn't matter what you name it. You just have to give it a name. I don't think you can name it anything that you already have. Any questions on that? Okay, so if I were to run this, Now, we're going to see, those of you who have done access, many of you have had some mm, exposure to access. I'm sorry for that, but no, no it, access is a perfectly good database. When you create a query in access, you save that query. When we create a query, we type the query in SQL. By the way, you can type your query in SQL in access also but you always save it when you, uh, you have to save it before you can run it. So you save it into the database. Now this really isn't a query. This is called in database, we call that a view when you save the query and we can save the query. It acts just like a table. So what I could have done with this, I could have created a view, created a query like I do in access, saved the query with a name, and it would have been, as far as I'm concerned, a table. Okay, I'll show you what I mean by that. That's coming up in a few, few modules. We're gonna do it. <coughs> um, so if I give it a name, I could say select um, vendor name MyMax from, and then I just give the name of that query instead of retyping the query. So I could have said create the, um, as D, well, let me show you what I mean. I'm getting a little ahead here. Create view, <clears throat> create a query like I'm going to create, like you would create a query in Access. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it DD. I've already got one here. I'm already calling this one D as now the reason that's red is because a creating a query has to be the first thing so this is the place that i must have a go okay so the create creating the view or creating anything really likes to be the first thing i'm not sure that it's going to let me do that can be the only statement in the batch there you have to bracket a create view in, in go statements that's go create the view go so what that go does it breaks it into batches now some people are writing go 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 everywhere they go they write go you don't have to do that after a create statement, after any create statement, you should have a go. After create table, sometimes it'll let you get away with it without one, but after creating a table, you should have go. In a creating a view, you have to have go. So you have it before and after. If it's the first statement in a batch and the only statement in the batch, you don't need them. If it's just one file, you create it. Now, when I create this, when I run this, it will create this subquery and it will save it as a table. So I'm going to execute this. When I execute, all I get is that it, complete, com, it, it worked. Now I can say, select 
everything from DD. So I can treat it just like a table. So when I execute this, I will see it just as if I had run this when I execute. I'm going to see all of the vendor name and the vendor ID, vendor name, and the maximum um, of the payment total, just as if I had run the query. So the query is saved into the database. It does not cost me any data. I don't have to run any, don't have to store any new data. Every time I select from it, it runs the query. And this is essentially what I'm doing up here <clears throat> when I say this. I'm essentially doing the same thing. Now, all I'm going to do here, I've taken, I'm taking out the vendor ID, so I'm going to get exactly the same values, but not the vendor ID because I'm not selecting the vendor ID. Am I making any sense? No. Getting a lot of blank stares. Basically, I'm saving a query. I have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> yes. When you save the query and access. Mm-hmm. Right, you're in a, uh, the question was, a question, question is developing, you save your query, you give it a name, and the query is saved into the database, and since you're in a graphical user interface, you can just click on it, yes. Uh, so the question is, there's a, the difference between access and SQL is that you have to do the select statement. The answer to that is SQL Server has a GUI just like access. Um, well, in, uh, in SQL Server, uh, if I go to view my object, I usually run with my object explorer off. If I open databases and I open the Notice I have one here called views. Well, th when you see view, think query that's saved into the database. And there it is, DD right there. And if I double click on it, um, and there are the data. So I have everything in SQL Server Every, everything you have in Access, you have an SQL server to some extent. Uh, Access does some things you sh really shouldn't have. Um, Access has some things that they call, um, what do they call, lookup fields. You don't have anything like that in SQL server. You have a multi-valued field. Don't have anything like that in SQL server. Okay. So, um, and you, you can also, if you go down, if you drill into Access, you'll find that SQL under the covers. If you go to SQL view, so you have um, uh, data view, data sheet view, and what's the other one called? One of them is called data sheet, one of them is called some other view, and then SQL view. If you look at SQL, you'll see the SQL that creates that table. So access does run on SQL. Okay, I'm creating a couple of tables here. Well, uh, let's talk about a table. Let's talk about table creation. Uh, so this will go kind of to number one, uh, part, part one of the test. I wanted to see the tables dropped in the correct order. Uh, so, for example, the child table, this is the child. Child table gets dropped first, then the parent table. And with this, with this language right here, if the object ID is not null, this is not SQL. This is unique to SQL server. There is usually a way to do this. 
if all you said was drop a table, child table, whatever its name is, uh, and that table did not exist, you would get uh, a re an, an error for your reading pleasure. But that's fine if it uh, if you don't mind the error, just go ahead. But the if statement suppresses that petulant error. <clears throat> then drop the parent. <clears throat> so I'm looking for them to be dropped in that order. Now I'm going to create the parent. I'm looking for the constraint primary key to be named. Uh, this particular one I copy, I copy and pasted from someplace. This one uses integer for the <clears throat> um, product ID. That's fine. It uses in var char for the name. It's okay if you just use a char field. See, a char, just plain char. In var char supports um, uh, international characters. Var char is a <clears throat> um, field that can expand and contract. If I've only got 30 or 40 characters, I'll usually just make it char, just fixed length. If I get over 250, 300 characters and they're gonna be widely different, I will <clears throat> go to Varchar. Price is an integer. I could have made it money. Details is there's probably a place for a Varchar. And then the constraint for the primary key questions. That's what I'm looking for on creating the table. Then inserting into the table, insert the, and I'm looking for the, <clears throat> the field list to the, P, the product ID, name, price, details. One, two, three, four, laptop, and the price, <clears throat> and what they are. Okay. This is that's a plain vanilla parent table. And then the sale record, so this is the sales table. Uh, we have the sale ID. Notice this one is an identity. I haven't done a whole lot with identity. What is an identity in a table? Uh, those of you who had access. You had auto number. One, two, three, four, so it automatically numbers. Questions? Um, I don't care for them a whole lot. There's other ways I can do it better, but this, this particular author wrote identity. So the first one will be one, two, three, four. It's, one good, it's a good way to get a primary key if you don't have one. Uh, you can also timestamp it. Then we have the PID, it's an integer that references back. How many did we sell? What day did we sell it? We have a primary key, and I am certainly looking for the foreign key <clears throat> on, that, uh, on part one. So I was looking for foreign keys. Then we're doing an insert. <clears throat> Now I don't uh, need to insert the, the sale ID because that's gonna get automatically inserted. The product ID of two, I sold three of them on this date. Product three, I sold five of them on this date. Sold two, I sold two of them on this date. Four, two, and four. Notice that I do not have anywhere in here product ID one. I have sold no product ID ones You're with me. That's gonna become an issue. Product ID one is a childless parent. Has no sales records attached to him. I could find him with an outer join. <clears throat> and that was one of the things that, uh, so I, I typically will always give on test one, either a, a, a childless parent or a child with an invalid parent. I chose to give the child with the invalid parent. So here is the select statement <clears throat> that will do that. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at this guy. First of all, he is a derived table. Uh, yes, derived table. So the subselect um, is in the, I'm selecting from him. So he's a table in the from line, in, in the select line is where, so that, that subquery is up there. I'm selecting from the subquery. Excuse me, I'm not selecting. Yes, I'm selecting stuff from the subquery. So he's, he's up in the select line. 
Okay, so he can go here. Now, I may have gotten a little too ambitious with this. What is up there? Select the sum of the sold quantity from the sales record table where the PID <clears throat> equals products table dot PID. Now, notice that this one, products table, references the table that is outside of the query. This is what we mean by a correlated subquery. Whenever we have a subquery that references the outside table, we have a correlated subquery. Now, this one is not quite as intuitive to me. This is what we're trying to do here. Let me see if I... <laughs> This code right here would give us the same thing. Select P name, the sum of the sold quantity as total, products table, enter join sales record table, group by P name. Why am I grouping by P name? Why do I group by P name? I have to group by P name. Come on, Kathy, go with us. Yeah, because I have an aggregate function in there, sum or average or count, anything. And, to, and, and P name is not aggregated. I must group by. Now this one is gonna give me the same thing. So select the name and the sum of the, of the sold quantity. And then I join them together so that I can take stuff from either table. And when I execute this, well, let's see. Oh, I haven't created them yet, have I? Ha 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 ha. Okay, now I have created them. Okay, I'm going to run this um, aggregated with a group by. And notice that I get the fridge, the TV, and the washing machine. I sold, I sold uh, 12 fridges, 5 TVs, and 11 washing machines. Now, to me, that's pretty clear. Joining the two tables, aggregating the sold quantity, grouping by the name. I really should group by the, um, whatchamacallit, the, the product ID, because I don't know that the name is gonna be unique, but it's a little simpler if I, do, if I group by the name. And I just have a small table. Okay, I'm gonna get the same thing from this table. So here I say select P name and then select the sold quantity from this where the PID of the sales record table is equal to the PID of the outside table. Do you see what's going on there? That is called a correlated subquery because the inner query takes something from the outer query. So every time the outer query runs, the inner query runs. Now you ask, well, why don't you just do a group by? This is another way to do a group by. This, is, this amounts to a group by. <laughs> now the difference here is if I execute this from products table, I put the order by in there. If I execute this, I'm gonna get something that's a little strange. Notice that I get this um, little line right there, line number two, that's saying laptops. Well, you didn't sell any laptops. <coughs> Well, that's a little tricky to get rid of that. Um, 
I tried it several ways. I tried, I started thinking about it in terms of what can I do to that subquery. So I was, I kept wanting to try to work on the subquery and I wanted to say where, so I, I wanted to put a, <clears throat> another one and, and products ta products table dot PID is not null, it didn't work. And P underscore ID is not null, that didn't work. Finally, I started asking why did I have it? And the reason I get it is I get it because I'm selecting from the products table. Okay, <clears throat> so basically the products table is my parent. And I have to change that products table in such a way that I suppress those null children. The only way that I can do that is I have to put another subquery in here where a PID is in, go out there and look at the sales record table and find all of them that are there. And that will suppress the null. So that is a bit of a pain. I, I don't think, I don't care for this example so much. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't do it this way. I would do it this way. That makes more sense to me, <clears throat> a table join. I use a subselect when everything I want comes from one table. In this case, I have actually, I have two tables. I, the P name comes from the products table and the sold quantity comes from the sales, sale record table. So to me, this lends itself more to an inner join. I can take them from either table, thus. <clears throat> this particular one though does demonstrate the idea that a subselect can appear in the, <clears throat> in the select line. So select from a select statement. Or I can select a select statement. Notice that that select statement only returns one, one value. <clears throat> I think that's required. Um, I just thought I'd mention that. What time are we? 37. <clears throat> uh, let's go back to this one. Uh, select the vendor name and invoice ID. This is the same one that we started with here, selecting the, we'll go back up to this one. <clears throat> yeah. Anytime I have this problem, Subselect is my tool. Anytime my problem says find the maximum value and ties, not just find the maximum value, but find the invoice ID or the vendor ID or something about it that has that value. And I have to get ties in there. So I might get, I might have two, I might have three, I might have 300. If I have to do that, I want to subselect. And this is the tool that gets it. Okay, it's a very handy one. <clears throat> okay. Now, most of the time I can write my inner and outer joins as a subselect. The time I'm gonna go for a subselect, and I like subselects, time I go for them is when everything I want comes from one table. Everything I want comes from one table. It's subselect. Every, all of my output comes from one table. I might have to hit two tables to validate it. All of my output comes from one table. So I think subselect in those, but you could also do it another way. But what if all of your output does not come from one table? Let's look at it. <clears throat> in this case, I want the vendor name and the vendor ID. <clears throat> Oh, and let's look at the invoice total too. Now, look at what I'm selecting. Now feel this. Notice what tables they come from. 
It comes from two different tables. I don't have as nice of a case right now for the subselect. I would probably do this one as a, as a join. I'm going to have to join. I'm taking stuff from two tables. If I do a subselect, I can only take stuff from the outer table. I can't return anything from the inner table. So I'm kind of stuck here. Have to be in the outer table. Outer table, I'm going to have to join the vendors and the invoices in the outer table. So I do. Where invoice total is in the subselect. Now that's fine. So I'm validating against that, but I'm selecting this. Um, so now I'm going to see the um, vendor name and the vendor ID. Vendor ID is easy, I can, and the invoice ID. Uh, invoice ID is easy. I can get that from the um, invoices table. Don't need the vendors for that, but I need the vendors for vendor name. When I execute that, oh, what is my problem here? I guess I better say use my database. And notice that oh okay <clears throat> this is uh, this is a little bit different one uh, this one's a correlated subquery also so this one has changed <clears throat> I want the vendor name uh, this one I am taking the invoice that is the greatest invoice per vendor, greatest invoice per vendor. So I want the vendor name, all of the vendor names, I should have 100, what is it, 114? No, I got 35. Oh, because I only have 35 vendors that have invoices. So I have 35 vendors that have invoices and I want to know for each vendor, so there, anytime I hear that language, for each vendor, what is the greatest invoice? So I'm gonna have to execute this guy this inner loop once for each vendor. Okay, that calls for a correlated subquery. Now there's other ways to write this and other ways that might even be better from an understand it position. Don't worry too much about being nice to the database. The database is free to change it from one to the other as it pleases. Okay, so let's look at how I'm saying this. I'm saying select the max of the invoice total from invoices, and I must rename it. Notice I have invoices on the outside. He's named I. I have invoices in the inner query. He's named I sub, where I dot vendor ID is equal to I sub dot vendor ID. Okay, this is a pure sub. This is a pure correlated subquery. The last one was a little odd because it was up in the select line. This one is down where I like to see them a little bit better. I'm, I'm a little happier with them when they're in the, in the um, where line. I tend to think that way more. But they can go in any place. Subquery can be any place. Um, notice that the, this inner query, the I sub, this is invoices, is I sub down here. Notice that the where is referencing not only the invoices table here, but also the invoices table in the query above. Do you see that? Anytime you have that, you have a correlated subquery. Kevin, are am I? Uh, is my audio on? Okay. Calcadon, I guess. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. I hope I'm making the recording. This thing was a little squirrely earlier. I guess I'll turn on my. Okay. 
Now, let's look at this one. Select vendor name, max invoice ID. From vendors enter joint invoices on this guy, group by vendor name. Um, in my opinion, in my opinion, this second subquery is more understandable. I'm using, I'm just saying group by there. So when you look at it, a correlated subquery can usually be thought of as a group by. Well, why don't you just do group by, you might say. Well, this is another way to do it. Sometimes the task, um, if it were, if in this particular case, it really doesn't matter which one you do. You're going to get exactly the same output. If you put an order by, since we have order by vendor name on there, I will have no way of telling by looking at the output which one you did. I can find out which one the computer uses, but I don't have any idea how the computer is going to approach it, how the SQL system will approach it. I can find out, but that's just uh, it might do it either way. So these are two equivalent statements. Second one is shorter. In my opinion, the second one is easier to understand. But the first one demonstrates a correlated subquery. So you have to do it, you have to either use the correlated subquery or a group by one of the two. Questions? Okay, um, I'm gonna make, uh, have I made the assignment yet from, let me see. From the subqueries, Looks like I have not. I'm going to go ahead and make the assignment for this. I'll make it do. <laughs> I'll make the assignment after class during the break. I'm going to move on now. I'm going to skip over for right now. Um, Data manipulation, I think we have done probably enough of that. Data manipulation has been covered in module four, where we inserted data, insert, update, delete data. This covers it a little bit more in depth. Um, you were asking me about that, uh, Mingwa. Um, there's a little more in depth here, uh, so this covers it in the in the textbook. I don't think I'm going to make this assignment, but the the it's certainly available to you. I'm going to I'm going to publish it, but I'm not going to assign chapter nine uh, module nine. I'm publishing it so that you can read it. Okay, I'm going to move on to data types. And topic near and dear to my heart. Have you guys taken any programming classes? Java, C, no, no Java, ja JavaScript. JavaScript is a little, JavaScript is an interesting language, actually, and an important one. Um, it doesn't demonstrate what I wanted to demonstrate, though. Um, let me see what I've got here. Uh, okay, I'm going to go through this. Data types, think about the types that we put on. So we, when we created a table, we gave the field a name. And then we stated what type it was. You will always have to do this. Uh, do you do it in JavaScript? JavaScript is a little strange in that 
is kind of a dynamic thing. It can change as you run through it. Most computer programming languages, when you name a variable, so I'm going to name this variable, let's name it. Its name is X. <coughs> and once I give the variable a name, I have to say what type it is. Sometimes you do it before, sometimes after. Um, for example, in C, you would say the type and then the name. In, in database, you say the name first and then the type. That's fine. It's uh, just fine either way. And there's three, well, there's, there, there's basically three types of data. I'm not going to cover this last one, but the first one I'm going to talk about is string or character data. We've seen two of two types of that. Uh, actually, there's four, but uh, what what we call it? We, one of them was called char, and I told you how big it was. So you'll always have to say how big the the data are. The other one is var char. That is a variable length. And then I give you its maximum size. So if I say char ten, that means you have ten characters. Lots of people on the test uh, would say that. Uh, T telephone number, how many numbers are in a telephone number? Well, there's seven. And then they put a dash in it when they tried to put it into the, well, that counts as a, as a character. So you'd have to give me one more. It was too, too small. You can't be too small. If you chop it off and then you try to insert it, it isn't going to work. Well, it will if you insert into varchar, but it won't if you insert into, into char. Uh, so, so character data. It might be one character, it might be a hundred characters in a string. Characters. Now, if you say in char or in var char, you're getting a character that supports international um, encoding. So, uh, for if in, in your computer, you probably download uh, support for Chinese characters, perhaps, or Japanese characters, or Korean characters. Uh, and, be, and that would be in char. You would have to go to that. Now that uses 16 bits for each character, whereas just a regular ASCII code takes eight bits per character. So if you know you're only going to be speaking to a, an audience that uses plain, just standard English. It came as a big shock to us about 1970 or so when we in the United States discovered that there are other languages out there. Um, and so we had, for a long time, we had the ASCII, which was the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And when we realized, hey, wait a minute, other people were developing computers and they were incompatible. So we moved up to a longer character instead of an 8-bit character, we're a 16-bit character. We didn't just double the number of characters we can, we doubled them eight times. So with 16 bits, I can get something like 64,000 different characters. <coughs> Whereas with eight bits, I can only have 120, I can have 256 different characters. <coughs> Goodness off tonight okay the other one I can have numeric a number is different from uh, from a string if I st and this is a thing that lots of people have problems on and after this module I'm gonna start being um, a lot stricter on it if it is a number what types are numbers integers for one Money is a number. It is a number if it makes sense to add, subtract, multiply, and divide it. Is your phone number really a number? Cheep, 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 cheep. No, why? Why? Characters, why? It makes no sense at all to add, subtract, multiply, and divide your phone number. What would you get if you divided your phone number by two? Would it make any sense? Would it be a phone number? No. What would you get if you added two of them together? I don't know what it would be. It wouldn't make any sense. Okay, same thing, your social security number. Same thing, a room number. 
Now, room numbers, perhaps, because room numbers tend to go in order, but even, even characters, I can say, well, what is the next one that looks like this? So this is 133, I can still say 134 and still talk about it being a character. It doesn't make any sense to add 133 to 251. That's not even a room in this building. We don't even have a third floor. Uh, so most of the time I'm gonna use characters. When you use characters, they're in quotes, single quotes. When you use numbers, they are not in single quotes. What about money? Is that a number or a character string? What? Why do you say a number? Does it make sense? <clears throat> if we were, let's, let's go out for something after class, guys. Let's all go out to the pub for a beer. Okay, let's see how much money we've got. Does it make sense to take all of our money and add it up? And that's a quantity of money that we have? It makes sense. You might not do it, but I mean, it, it makes sense. Okay, so money is definitely a number. A uh, number may or may not have a decimal point. Okay, you see where I'm going with this. And then finally, temporal, dates, times, or both. So the time of day. Um, so there's three of them right there. They fall into three big categories, strings, or character data, numbers, and dates, dates and times. The last one I'm not even gonna bother with. The last one is called what we call large binary objects. These are called blobs um, <clears throat> and lots of other things they're called. So this could be images, videos, digitized fingerprints. They're not very exciting to us um, because I can't easily compare one fingerprint to another. Now there are ways of doing it, but it's very processor intensive. I can't compare a picture. Um, lately we're getting to where pictures <clears throat> can be searched. There, there was an old problem in an artificial intelligence. Uh, can you write a computer program that will tell you what a picture of a chair, they show it a picture of a chair and it will say, yes, it's a chair or no, it is not. Any child can tell you it's a picture of a chair, but a computer can't tell you that. It has to work on any chair. Uh, you know, sofa, chair, one of these chairs, upside down chair, it just has to say it's a chair. Um, and we're, I think we're gonna get there. I think we're gonna be to the point where we can, uh, the computer programming can do that. I mean, you see they've got them driving cars now. What'd you think? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right, I think, I don't know whether that one has been solved or not, but it won't surprise me if it had, you know, 20 years ago, I would have said no way ever. But lots of things that I said 10 years ago that I said no way are gonna happen, have happened. So every time I say no, I've, I've quit saying no way. If somebody says, hey, you think this is, happening? no way, I'm gonna say no way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, large binary, objects. I'm not gonna do these, so I'm gonna stick with these three. Strings or characters, numbers, temporal data. <coughs> Dates, integers. <clears throat> two, computer program almost always treats integers all the same way. There are essentially two decisions I have to make about an integer. If I have an integer, do I have to represent both positive and negative decimal points? As positive and negative numbers, or is it just a number? Um, think of an example. Um, <clears throat> how far is it to the nearest star? Well, I don't know, it's a long way. Um, is there any star that is a negative distance? No, we think of them as all distances from, assumably, I guess, the center of the Earth to that star, I guess, the center of the star. So it's just a distance. 
um, there's no negative distances, so it's just an absolute value. Oh, what else? Um, oh. Um, anyway, some things, uh, some things have <coughs> uh, your salary. You probably, your salary is probably always positive. Very, very seldom would it ever be negative. You don't get negative salary. You'd have to pay them to work there. Are you kidding? Um, <clears throat> how big will this thing get? How much storage will we allocate for that integer? Four bytes is very common size for an integer. How big can an integer get? Oh, it's seven o'clock. I'm going to go just a little bit longer. I'm going to cover integers. How big can it get? What is the biggest integer? What? On your, on your uh, mechanical odometer, the biggest five, 99,999 is the biggest integer I can represent in five digits. What's the biggest integer? Well, there isn't a biggest integer, but there is always a limit. Any electromechanical device will always overflow. Do you remember, anybody here remember when you had a car that only had five, five digits on the odometer, on the speedometer? How far your car's gone? You remember that? You don't remember it. <laughs> Kathy, do you remember a, a car that when you drove 100,000 miles, it turned over to zero? 100,000. So 99,999999, then it carried out of range and went to zero. They used to do that. <laughs> um, uh, all of my examples have become obsolete. Nobody remembers that anymore. Used to be telephones did not have a Q or a Z <clears throat> on the dial pad. If you look at your cell phone, uh, Q and Z, the number that corresponds to Q and <clears throat> I guess it's nine corresponds to Z, they all have four, four letters on them because there didn't used to be a Q or a Z. <coughs> um, Okay, there's always an upper bound. Now, if I go with four bytes, how many bits are in four bytes? Okay, I'm losing everybody here. What I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna cap this off and we're gonna put a, uh, we're gonna take a break tonight. We're gonna come back to this. We're gonna take a break and then I'm gonna cover the test. Fair enough. And so I'm gonna go over the test in detail. I've reviewed the um, subqueries and then I'm gonna go with chapter 10. I'm not gonna cover chapter nine, at least not at this time. Galkadan, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. I hope I am making a recording here. Pause the recording. Okay, back to recording now. I'm uh, gonna refer, be referring to the test. Here is the copy of the test. Um, in part one, I ask you to, this, is, this one was worth 20%. I ask you to create um, two tables. <clears throat> doctors and patients. I was fussy about the table names because they, you know, I wanted them named just like that. 
And if they weren't, they, it made it kind of hard for me to run them and make sure they all worked. A doctor has an ID, primary key, first name, last name, address, and phone. Uh, let's see. Constrain all last names against null. Um, okay, so doctor ID, first name, last name, address, phone, all of these would be character fields. However, if you chose to make the doctor ID field an integer, I didn't count off. <clears throat> and see what it would look like. I'm looking for you to say use your database. I would prefer you not to say use AP underscore DB here because we're just creating some tables that we're playing around with and we don't want to clutter up the AP database, the accounts payable database. That's, uh, we get to do anything we want to in there. We can drop the tables, but we would prefer not to put a lot of extra clutter in there because we might accidentally create something that gets in the way of what we want to do. Uh, so I'm going to use my working database, the one that has my name on it. And naturally, if I run your tables, if I run your table create, I would have to run it in my own database. So I won't have this data, I won't know your name, but I, I can see it and I'm, I'm, not look, I'm looking for the one with your name on it. I'm looking for the patients and the doctor's table to be dropped in the correct order. Uh, notice I have to drop the patients first, then the doctors. Then I create them in reverse order. So I create the table doctor. Doctors, uh, be careful about that, Smith. Um, and it has the primary key. I give it a name. I am making mine to be a char four. You could have used integer. It would have been fine. I didn't, I wouldn't have said a word. Uh, and then the name, this is rep. Um, maybe I'll call this L name. Um, D L name. Okay, so the, and then I've got I've got some other I think two or three other fields in there. I'll let you decide what to make them. If you said char, if if you said a phone number was char eight, then, excuse me, char seven, then that means you can only put seven characters into it, right? If you tried to put in eight on, in there, that in the insert statements, it wasn't gonna work. So whatever you put in there, I, I accepted. If you said it was 10 characters, I accepted 10 characters. Lots of times I'll go on up to 16 because that's a power of two. It gives me a good allocation size. But whatever you said, uh, as long as it was reasonable, if you said it was 160,000, I thought well, maybe that's a little too big. <clears throat> um, we name the constraints for the primary key, name the constraint to check that the last name is not null. Questions? Create table. Patience. What does a patient have? A patient has a patient ID. Integer would be fine. I'm gonna make mine char four just to be consistent, I guess. And what do they have? They have a patient first name, a patient last name, a patient phone, all of that jazz. Um, I guess I'll give him 16. If you gave him 32, that would work for me. So I didn't argue, I didn't argue with this size as long as you didn't try make it too small and try to put in something that was bigger. And then you get an error. So if you made it big enough to hold your data, that was fine. And then what else did you have? Oh, I don't know, first name and an address and a phone number, all of that stuff. We won't worry about what it is. But then I'm looking for you to have here a D ID. Now it is best in programming SQL if you do not have a blank line. And if you had blank lines in there any place, I put a little note in there about this is a bad practice. SQL Server doesn't care. 
Most of them don't, but I can show you a platform, a very popular one named Oracle that will care if you put a blank line inside, inside of it. Now between them is fine, have all you want there. After you close and before you start the next one, you can have blank lines galore. But inside the statement, do not have a completely blank line. If you want to simulate a blank line, put a dash dash on it. <clears throat> and what we have here is the, the idea, and I'm just gonna copy this. So I basically, I just copy this guy, copy, paste. He must be exactly the same type must be the same type. And I like it when he's the same name. Won't always be the same name. Okay, so my constraints. Got these two constraints. Sometimes people will put a dash dash for a blank line between that and their constraints. There's their constraints. And so this is the patient primary key is the PID. Null last name, check that the patient last name is not null. And I can't have two constraints in the same database named the same. Okay, so I need to, I usually make my constraint names kind of long. Check that the patient last name is not null. Constraint, doctor, Patient underscore FK. What's FK? Foreign key. S T S T R A I N T. Okay. <clears throat> Did I spell that right? Looks right. Oh, right here. And put a semi no. <clears throat> semicolon. Getting fussy about semicolons. I think I gave you one that you, uh, I allowed you to miss one, maybe two, but if you just didn't put any semicolons, I took off. Um, SQL Server will let you get away without it. Okay, what's this, what's going on here? I got my foreign key constraints and now I want some inserts. Okay. Insert. Oh, by the way, I didn't make, I, I haven't made a big deal out of this, but I have created two things. Anytime that you create something, you really should have Go after it. Go is not an SQL term. It is unique to SQL Server, but every database has one that says, okay, do that. In Oracle, it is the word commit. You say commit. Commit means something different in, um, and SQL Server. So here you say go, that means do everything above this and start a new, a new batch. So between these guys, it's not so much, uh, this one isn't as important, but this one, after I have created the table and before I do my inserts, I will have go. You don't have to have go between every statement. Now only put two values in there. And in fact, if you'd only put two values in there, it would have worked. You just have to have a, prime, a foreign key and a DL name. The rest of them, I just, I just used placeholders there. That's where those, the rest of the fields are gonna go. 
Now, one more. Oh yeah, I mean five more like that, or however many more I told. What did I say? Four or five or three or I forget what I said. But um, basically, I just I want you to insert some data. You cannot insert the same. Some people just tried to insert this same record five times. That's not going to work. You have to change the primary key at least. It'd be nice if you change the name. Insert into patients. Have to insert the doctors first. Insert the patient ID, the patient name, and the doctor for that patient. Patient ID can just as well be A, B, C, D. Doesn't have to be digits, it could be anything you want. That'd be too big. <clears throat> Comma, P name, Smith, Dr. ID. What do I have to put for the Dr. ID? I only have one of them. <clears throat> it's got to be one, two, three, four. So this patient is a patient of Dr. number one, two, three, four, Dr. Jones. If I have other doctors, okay. Now this one, if I execute him, something happen. Um, oh. Uh, P, P, K, okay, well apparently I have something here in the database that's causing me some problems. I'm gonna go to my object explorer. That's the good thing about going over here to my SW Smith database. I can look at the tables. I got a whole bunch of them. I'm just gonna delete them. Probably a parent. Products. Let's see if that works. Okay, so I'm gonna run it and it runs and so everything's, uh, everything looks like it's fine. I've got one minor problem with this table that I haven't done yet. And let's look at that a doctor has, a doctor has many patients. A patient must have what? How many, pay, how many doctors does a patient have? Hmm. Exactly one. This is a one to many relationship. Foreign key relationships are one to many. Can a patient have zero doctors? Not according to this. In my database, can a patient have zero doctors? A patient can have zero doctors in my database because if I change it, um, what if I insert null? Can I insert null there? Uh, well, why, why can't I? I've got a not null constraint on the patient last name. I don't have a null constraint on the doctor ID. If I, if I execute this, it will run. Uh, okay, okay, what did I? Oh, got it, highlight, yeah. Duh, anyway, yes, see, it works fine. <laughs> So I need a null constraint on the DID. Now I didn't take off a whole lot on that. Um, I don't. I I think I kind of factored that into some other stuff. <clears throat> I was I was fairly lenient, I thought, on grading this. But this was what I was looking for. I would like to have a. Um,
No. Foreign keys can be null. Check that. Uh, Now, if I try to put in a null DID, this is going to collide. And conflicts with check constraint, notice that I see the constraint name as part of the output, which is what I really like doing, because sometimes if I'm not in this nice little GUI, um, graphical user interface, it's, those names can get really Okay, and, and a, a few more inserts. Yes, go ahead. Right, um, you, can, you can change this. It is okay to have fewer names here in the value list than you have in the table. So for example, um, I didn't have to, <clears throat> all, of these, I, all of these I would have to have because it's constrained, I can't just have null in the name. Um, but if, if, this, if this constraint, were not here, this constraint, if this constraint were not here, then I could just insert DID, close it right there, and then just insert one, two, three, four. So I can have fewer columns <clears throat> in the values statement than I do in the table. But whatever I have in the uh, values, I have to have that many in, 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 the, in the field list, I'm gonna say, I have to have that many values. So if I have three fields in the field list, I have to have three values in the values statement. But it, I don't necessarily have to fill every gap in, in the table, except if they're constrained against not null, and even then I can give them a default value. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> you could write an SQL, how do you navigate and see what you've put in there? You could write an SQL statement that says select star from doctors, select star from patients, select asterisk. We say splat, actually. Um, or you could go over to the object navigator and say edit top 200 rows and it would show you everything in there. I, this being an SQL class, I, the answer then in an SQL class is you would execute the SQL query, select splat from doctors, semicolon. See everything that's there. <coughs> okay. Uh, let me get on here so we don't run out of time. <coughs> uh, this is just an insert. Insert the following record into the vendor's table. I would use, I usually copy. Let's see if I can copy just this part. I put it, I put it in a, um, <clears throat> it's in a, a table format. So you can copy just one row at a time. <clears throat> I did that deliberately. Hmm? Copy one column. So this is, <clears throat> this is number one. Come on. End, where's my end, end, comma, space. Yeah. 
Anyway, I'm going to go on with this, <clears throat> comma, and comma space. What? What about it now? Yeah, that might be the easiest thing to do. Matter of fact, I don't even have to. <clears throat> I just, that'll work right there. I would. <clears throat> and then these values. Zero. Null is just null. Uh, you don't, null is not in... I could use an empty bracket there, an empty um, I believe these are both Now, why is it going to... This one, we need to use APDB. Need a comma here. <clears throat> now, what I would do with this one, delete from... Now I'll be able to run it multiple times, so I'm going to test it. Execute. Invalid object name. I guess I better execute the whole thing. I don't care about the delete. It isn't going to bother anything. So delete didn't do anything, but one row got inserted. <clears throat> Um, it'd be nice if you made it look pretty. I usually like it when the <clears throat> I usually make them line up. <clears throat> then this one, I do the same thing. When I run off the edge of the page, I will page break it. It doesn't hurt anything if they run off the edge of the page. It just doesn't look very pretty. So I'm fussy about my code looking pretty. <clears throat> uh, this one is an update. Uh, that would change the terms ID to seven for invoices of vendor ID 115. So what, are, what table are we changing? What table? The invoices. So this guy is update. <coughs> Goodness. Apple. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Sorry about that. <clears throat> Terrible tickle cough. <clears throat> okay. Set. <clears throat> mm-hmm. <clears throat> What was it, 115? <clears throat> Something like that. And, <clears throat> goodness. And that's what I'm looking for. <clears throat> and I said, okay, I got the error. Now, why did it get that error? Foreign key constraint, yes. Why? What? What? Give me English. <clears throat> what? What's the problem? Oops. <clears throat> Vendor ID is a for um, terms ID is a foreign key into the terms table. Tell me about the terms ID. I see zero, <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five. I don't see a seven. There's no seven. Yes, no. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's not in there. So I can't put the foreign key to seven because there isn't a seven in the terms table. <clears throat> I'm going to go over to the terms table. See if I can expand this. What would happen if I put a seven in here? Let's put a seven. Term seven, XXX, X, X, terms due days, zero. I've just put a value of seven into the terms table. <clears throat> now what's going to happen? Now it's fine. <clears throat> Why didn't it work? There wasn't a seven over there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, zip code has changed from, so this one is just an update. <clears throat> update um, vendors set. Go ahead, please. The answer is no, because this class is SQL. Um, can you do it, or will I allow you to do that and call it an answer to an SQL question? <clears throat> I just did it. Can you do it? Yeah, you can do it. If you want to change some data in the table just to test your SQL, that's fine. If you want to go put a value of seven in there, go put a value of seven in there. But the question is, why wouldn't it work from the beginning? <clears throat> Why did you get the error from Jump Street? And the reason you got the error was because there wasn't a seven in the terms table, uh, uh, terms ID of seven in there. As soon as I put a terms ID of seven in there, everything's fine. I didn't mean for you to put one in there, but you could have. You can do anything to your data that you want to. It doesn't impact 
if, if you want to put some data in there, if you want to see, am I getting all of it? So you, you change something in there <clears throat> to make it come back on an SQL statement because I'm not getting any output. I'm going to change something and make it give me some output. Sure. Um, this is update. Let's see, what was that? <clears throat> that was the vendors table. <clears throat> Let's see, vendor zip code equals, I forget what it was, uh, I don't know, 73501, oh, whatever it was. <clears throat> whatever, I mean, whatever it's going to be. Using the values I gave. Uh, vendor zip code is a character field. It's not integer, so it does need uh, quotes. If you forgot to put the quotes, <coughs> um, the system will take them okay. If you didn't put the quotes on it, the system will do it. But it's it is it is not an integer. So I don't think this will give me an error. I think it'll say zero rows updated. It says nothing, but it didn't give me any errors. <clears throat> if you put one of them in quotes and one of them not in quotes, I took some points off. I said, well, at least be consistent, but they do go in quotes. <clears throat> uh, next one is, okay, delete vendor ID 82 from the vendors table. What is the problem with deleting a vendor from the vendors table? <clears throat> vendors is a parent table. What's the child table? Invoices. What do I have to delete first? Delete, delete from invoices where vendor ID is equal to 82, then delete from vendors. <clears throat> okay. Okay, the thing I do not like about this is if you highlight this guy and you accidentally highlight that and you execute it, you delete everything in the invoices table. You have to be careful. That's why I don't like it to execute without a semicolon. When I put the semicolon there, that means I'm done. Uh, others won't do it without a semicolon. They'll say, oops, stop, you gotta, gotta give me a semicolon before I'm gonna execute. <clears throat> um, now I can delete from vendors. So now I would have the same one deleting from vendors. Uh, it will take it if you just say delete invoices like that. I don't like that syntax. Uh, so I'm, delete from invoices, and now the second one comes along. Delete from vendors. Uh, uh, number six, let's see, I don't wanna run out of time here. Number six is like, so vendors uh, show the name and city for vendors in California who have a 559 area code and sort the output by city. I'm just gonna write the where clause. <clears throat> 
so this one is uh, where vendor state equals C A, not not double quotes like I just put. Let's see. In the instructions, did I say what a area code was? Did I clarify that an area code is? Oh, okay. Because it, it suddenly dawned on me that in this day of cell phones, not everybody uses uh, uh, area code anymore. You know, we don't think of it as a different, it's just part of the phone number. <clears throat> and vendor phone like. Uh, let's see, it's got a, uh, it's got a thing that makes it, you, makes it unique is th that it has that parentheses. Most of the time in a database, you wouldn't store the parentheses because they're on all of them. And what was that, 559? Five, five, close parentheses and anything else after it. There are other ways to do it. Other ways to do it, you could have used the left, left, <clears throat> Four is equal to left five would be open five five nine close. Um, other ways to do it like was I think the simplest way. <clears throat> In other words, you're looking for this sub pattern, looking for this pattern followed by anything. If you just said five five nine, Then it would have to begin at the it would have to begin at the beginning of the line. You could have dropped this one off just as you could have dropped that one and done it like that would have been just fine. <clears throat> but if you just said five five nine, you wouldn't get any because there's nothing that begins with a five. They all begin with the open parentheses. <clears throat> hmm. Okay, uh, number eight. I kind of snuck up on it, I'm, I kind of hid it in there. What you're looking for is invalid parents, invalid parents. So this one is looking for what, um, an invalid invoice line item, what's the parent of invoice line items? Go to view, object explorer. I always like to go to my database diagrams. New, invoice line items. I suspect it's probably invoices. <clears throat> and I was right. <clears throat> How are they related? How are they related? Mm -hmm. What relates them? <clears throat> What's the foreign key? Nina, this will appear on the uh, on the recording. <clears throat> Invoice ID. Notice that the invoice ID is the key of the invoices table <clears throat> and it is part of the key of the invoice line items table. It's, it's invoice line item has a two field key. I would not have done it that way, <clears throat> but they did it that way. I'm looking for something that's in here that is not in here. I'm looking for, I have a, an invalid parent. What kind of a query gives me children with invalid parents? I've got a, I'm, I'm looking for invalid parents is what that boils down to. So it goes through a lot of stuff and it tells you what the problem is. And the problem boils down to, if you read all that stuff in there, the, your problem boils down to you're trying to find an invalid parent. What kind of a query finds invalid parents? What is it, Nina? 
outer join and I want it outer join pointing at the parent table. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to write an outer join. I'll leave this open. <coughs> Select. <clears throat> okay. Well, kind of an outer join. Which one does it point at? The invoice line items <clears throat> or the invoices? Where are the invalid data? They're in there. So I want to know the, I want it to point to the other one. <clears throat> Invalid data here, so this is going to be a left. On I. <clears throat> That's the classic, find the invalid parent. Oh, by the way, I have to state which one, so I want it to come from I, uh, invoice ID. <clears throat> no, that give me nothing. I want it to come from, where, where is the invalid one? The invalid one's over here, so that's the one I want. When I execute this, I think I put one in there. What? Uh, yeah, left outer join because I want it pointing to invoices. <clears throat> Let's see, I want everything. Yeah, you're right, you're right. It is right, isn't it? <clears throat> everything from invoice line items. I thought I had one in there. There it is. Invoice ID 446. <clears throat> uh, it, there is a, it has a, a line item in there for 446, but there is no invoice number 446. <clears throat> if you were to go over there and look for it in the invoices table, you wouldn't find it. But there's an invoice line item referencing 446. So we have an integrity problem here. Maybe I should write that one differently. A lot of people, I think, got confused in the... <clears throat> I was trying to put it in the terms that you'd really see it in. But instead of just find the invalid parent, uh, what is it? What, what happens when you have an invalid parent in there? <clears throat> if, I tried to, if I tried to check that, check my integrity constraints, in other words, I said, you know, enable that. <clears throat> Uh, constraint with check, it wouldn't work. I couldn't enable the constraint. That happens all the time in, um, <clears throat> oh, the access class, because the access, they just start throwing data at the tables. And what happens is that the, um, they get bad data in there. And then the book tells you to go there and now create the relationships, in other words, the constraints. <clears throat> and it doesn't work. And the students, oh, they raise their hand. Oh, please help. You know, my, I can't follow the book. Well, what's the problem? You have invalid data. You have an invalid foreign key. And when you try to uh, enable the constraint, it doesn't work. This is, that's how you see it. Of course, a, a 1307 student isn't going to know that. <clears throat> but th this is how you find it. 
Yes, Nina. Invoice line items is the child. <clears throat> uh, so invoice line items, even though it is a key, it is part of the primary key in invoice line items, um, invoice line items is still the child that we can see that because it, the mini side is pointing here and the key side is pointing here. So the key that the parent is the side with the key on it in this diagram. These diagrams are very helpful because you cannot write SQL unless you know the schema. You have to know who is the parent of what. And sometimes it's a little bit like not knocking the Bible, but it's like reading the Bible and figuring out who begat whom. Um, <clears throat> and it can become kind of difficult. So trying to figure out which table is the, is the parent and which one is the child. <clears throat> so I usually go through there and kind of break it up. And I use my da database diagrams and I get them in there. For example, if I wanted to see um, how do I could like add a table to it and let's add vendors. And notice I see the, the relationship and where it goes. I don't have a direct um, link there. Any questions? I think that, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Did I miss one? Oh, yes, yes, I did right here. Um, <clears throat> right, it's kill query that will show the vendor name, uh, terms due days for vendors with a terms due days greater than 30. Okay, this one is, this one has two, two or three different answers. And let's see, I'm gonna take this out. I'll remove this table and I'm gonna add one more table. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, this one was this what I wanted here in this one. I wanted you to go through the invoices table, and so I wanted a for for this this question. Uh, this is question number seven. <clears throat> so like what uh, vendor name, vendor state, terms due days. <clears throat> <clears throat> from what <clears throat> vendors what is vendors joined to what? You're correct, but not because I wanted it that way. <laughs> Vendors is not directly joined to terms. <clears throat> but Kathy, you're going to tell us why you think it is. Default terms ID. There's no terms ID in the vendors table. you could join on the default terms ID from the vendors table directly to the terms ID in the terms table. <clears throat> now I didn't mean for that to happen. <clears throat> to follow the relationships, 
you would join to invoices and then terms ID to the terms table. So this is what I meant to happen. So enter join invoices on the <clears throat> a lot of people uh, would get it mixed up and say vendor ID is equal to the invoice ID nay nay that's like saying where are my shoe size is equal to my IQ <clears throat> and then we have one more <clears throat> and this is what I wanted. <clears throat> Uh, and <clears throat> terms due date should all be 30. Um, and so I got 111. Oh, I forgot my where. <clears throat> Was it greater than or greater than or equal to? greater than. I don't know that I have any. Maybe. Yeah, some of them. So I got six rows there. <clears throat> now, Kathy has pointed out that if you look at the <clears throat> diagram, you see you have a terms default terms ID. <clears throat> there is no foreign key relationship there. <clears throat> but you can infer one. Okay, now this is a field called data mining. And I'm about out of time here, but this query could be written as Vendor's date, terms, due days from vendors as V <clears throat> enter join on <clears throat> this one could be written like that. A lot of people did. So they followed that implicit link. And notice this time I got 11 rows because many times the um, default ID might be different from the ID that's in the um, vendor's table. <clears throat> so the, the data that are returned are slightly different. Okay, I accepted that. as long as you had the key right. Questions? Okay, I'm gonna put a lid on it for tonight <clears throat> uh, and start this. I am going to assign, um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to, as, for next week, I'm going to assign the um, module seven, I believe it was, the, the uh, uh, sub-queries, the exercise of sub-queries. And so I'll, I'll grade them beginning next week. Next week is, it's really rough on, on Friday classes because next week you do not have class on Friday. <clears throat> mm. 
Why? It is the day before, <clears throat> it, is, it is the Friday before Easter. It has a deep religious significance. It is called Good Friday, but I'm not allowed to say Good Friday, except that such that all Fridays are good, right? Um, <clears throat> but we call it Spring Holiday or something like that. And it's unfortunate that particularly if you have a, a Friday class and only on Friday class because you miss a whole bunch of class with spring break and well with that, that one is worse. Um, so we just come back from spring break, we have one class. So I'm going to make an assignment that um, my Friday classes are gonna have to take one of their classes online. I am going to cover the data types next week. I am making the, I'm going to skip module eight. Let me make sure I've got my modules right. Um, Okay, subqueries is module eight. <laughs> so I will make the assignment in module eight. It'll be due at next class period. I'm gonna skip module nine, data manipulation. Might come back and pick that up. And then next week I'm gonna go into uh, module 10. I've turned on the stuff from, uh, <clears throat> I've turned it on from module eight, excuse me, module nine. I think um, I think everything in there is in module four. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and leave that uh, <clears throat> enabled so you can see it, but I'm gonna skip module nine, move on to seven, but module eight, I haven't made the assignment at this moment, but I will, okay? I'm gonna turn off the recording now. <clears throat>